quote unquote, too good to be true. We believe you and we trust you that it is true. That we have a Savior, born of the Virgin. Lead us now this morning as we learn and we grow and we hear from you. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's children say, Amen. Well, this morning, we're about to focus our attention to the reality of Jesus. Well, mainly today, I want to share a reality of looking at Mary. If you look at the nativity set that is set up over here on, the, on your left, we have Mary dressed in the traditional blue garb. And I've often wondered, I never looked into it, but I often wonder, why blue? I don't know. But it doesn't matter, really. But what the focus is, is about, if you look at Mary, look where she is looking. She's looking to her son. She's looking at the one she remembers nine months previously. The angel Gabriel came to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Now, if I was Mary in that boat, I would probably say, Say what? Who? Me? I'm just a child. I'm a teenager. I'm going to be married to a man of my life, Joseph. I'm just your average, everyday person. It sounds far-fetched. It sounds crazy. And in some cases, it does not sound real. But here is this young lady Gabriel says, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. You shall be with child. And this child will, will be the savior of the world. And Mary ponders it. And like a good Lutheran, she asks the question, what does this mean? Okay, I was expecting a little more of a chuckle on that one. <laughs> But that was her pondering. That was her wondering. How, what does this mean? I, I don't get it. I don't understand. And then he tells her, you will become the mother of the Son of God. And he will give birth and he will be in this world and he will occupy the throne of the, your ancestor David. He will be the one that everybody around you is looking forward to. They're waiting for him. The time was right. Paul reveals in his letter to the Galatians, at just the right time. Which basically means it was a God thing, not a people thing. At just the right time, the Savior of the world was born. At just the right time, the announcement of the upcoming pregnancy of Mary was about to happen. Sounds far-fetched. What even sounds even more far-fetched is what G Gabriel says to Mary, and God the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and you will become a mom, and you will have this child growing inside of you. Now that part growing inside of you is a normal when, some, when someone is having a child. But the Holy Spirit causing the pregnancy? What? Somebody said today, if it happened today, and it happened in our environment today, and somebody said, I'm pregnant and the Holy Spirit's the Father, what would we do? Lock them away in a, psych in a psychiatric ward, probably. Because that's not possible. It is humanly impossible for that to happen. And yet it gets even crazier. I am a virgin. It is not possible for me to become pregnant. 
my, my husband and I, we, we've not consummated the marriage. Why is this happening to me? But Mary took it all in stride. And the answer to the Gabriel statement was, let it be as you have said. Let it be so. In other words, she said, Amen. Because that's what that phrase means. Amen. Let it be so. Doesn't sound real to you, does it? People, commentators, experts, quote unquote, have been trying to poke holes in the virgin birth for the last at least 20 to 30 years. They've been trying to say it couldn't happen. It is impossible. What the Bible says is wrong. Couldn't happen. And the experts and their infinitive wisdom you can, you can tell my tongue is deeply buried in my cheek right about now. In their infinite wisdom and all understanding of human thought and human physiology and all the other stuff that made the virgin birth and conception impossible, that's what they say. Well, nope, didn't happen that way. It's an analogy for something else. That's the real story, according to the experts. Well, we have another explanation to what the, the experts say, and that is simply bunk. You're crazy. Because the one thing lacking in your explanation is something that is so crucial for every Christian. For every Christian, this one thing is so important. And that thing is faith. That one key element is believing. Mary pondered it in her heart. She thought, this doesn't sound right. I'm sure at least a little bit popped into her head. But you know what she, what she said? Amen. Let it be. The truth of the matter is, the real side of Christmas is, if it wasn't an immaculate conception, using it in the context of our terminology, meaning Jesus was conceived immaculately. If it didn't happen, Jesus could not be our Savior. Think about it this way. Who has the authority to forgive sins? Pastor James and I? Nope. If you, if, you look at, if you look at the verbiage that Pastor James just spoke a few moments ago, I in the place of and at the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you. It's not me. It's Jesus. It's God forgiving sin. The people in the day of Jesus didn't understand if you remember the, the event in the life of Jesus. Here are these men, they're bringing a friend of theirs who was paralyzed, could not walk. And this friend wanted to see Jesus because they thought Jesus could heal his friend, but they couldn't get to him. The crowd was so thick around the house, they could not get inside. So they got ingenious. They poke a hole through the roof. This was back in the day when roofs were made out of straw and thatched roofs, and I can imagine being in the living room of the house and feeling the straw come down on my head. What's wrong with the roof? Look up, and here's this kid coming down on a mat. What are the first words that Jesus says to him? Not rise, take up your mat, and walk. What did he say to him? Your sins are forgiven. And then the Pharisees amongst themselves that were there, the Pharisees and the scribes who started muttering amongst themselves, wait a minute, he can't do that. He can't do that. Only God can forgive sins. 
Jesus, knowing and hearing the muttering, says, Just let me tell you, so that the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins. So the agent of forgiveness is God. The means by which God forgives the sins is Jesus, his Son, the second person of the Trinity. So Jesus had to be God in order for him to forgive our sins. He also had to be human. He had to be a human being to experience everything that we experience as sinful human beings, save one. Jesus was without sin. If you, if you wonder how that could be, refer to part one, that Jesus is God. Jesus can't sin. He's God. Jesus forgives sin. He's God. And by means of his dying upon the cross, that was the instrument of God's forgiveness. The man, the person of Jesus Christ who was cursed because he hung on a tree was the instrument of God's salvation and forgiveness and grace. <clears throat> seem far-fetched? Does that seem real to you? Yup. It does. Does it go against every ounce of my rational being? Does it go against every ounce of logic and common sense that I have in my being? Yes, it does. At the same time, it goes in perfect concert with my faith. And I pray for all of you as it is for myself, we say the words that Mary said. In spite of all of what could have not made sense, Mary said one simple thing, and I pray that that's what we say also. So let it be done. So let it be as you have said. And all God's children say, Amen. And the peace